Hi, everyone. I am Sarah Feldman with the Consortium for Service Innovation. I'm joined by several of my fellow staff members today and um, some certified KCS trainers that were really excited to feature their wisdom and experience on our chat today. Hopefully you came to talk about how to adopt in waves as part of our KCS transformation series. Today, we're gonna review a bunch of existing resources that our amazing consortium members have spent uh, 30 plus years developing for your adoption guidance. We're gonna showcase some great examples and uh, recommendations that are already out there from those consortium members as well that they've shared over the years. Uh, lots of great tricks and uh, wisdom to follow for KCS success and plenty of Q&A with our certified trainers that are joining us today. Speaking of our certified trainers joining us today, let's give them a little showcase. We have Kai joining us from Germany, uh, Jennifer Crippen and David Kay also joining us. Uh, do y'all wanna say hi real quick, introduce yourselves? Certainly. Hi, I'm Jennifer Crippen with DBK and Associates. I'm in Southern Oregon in Medford, um, and I'm a certified trainer and consultant uh, working with David Kay. Great to be here. Can't wait to hear what your questions are and, and talk about adoption. Thank you. And I'm David Kay, uh, working with Jennifer. Uh, we have been focused for the last 20 some years on uh, helping people become successful with their KCS programs. Uh, starting them up, reinvigorating them, and uh, everything in between. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kai. I'm coming from Hanover, Germany, and um, my colleague Tamara is with me. So we are as well KCS um, certified trainers. And like David and Jennifer said, we're focusing on the success of our customers, helping them to adopt KCS and um, other methodologies like swarming. So. Amazing. So glad, so glad y'all are here. Very lucky to have you join us. And as we called out here, uh, Process and DBK and Associates both offer KCS V6 aligned services. So lots of opportunities to, to get additional help from them if you would like that in your KCS adoption journeys. Speaking of folks who are on the call today, we asked a registration question, an optional reg registration question from folks to find out kind of how big your programs are. And this is a little chart, uh, ChatGPT helped me make this chart, shout out to our new colleague. <laughs> uh, about the uh, either current or potential program sizes. And I think this is really interesting. Some of these numbers are too high for me to even, that's too many zeros for me to even say, I think. Um, and then we have a few, you know, programs of, of one or less than 10, um, lots lots in the middle. So I think that's uh, really fun to see. Uh, hopefully you see yourself represented here, your potential KCS program represented here. And just for fun, a couple of the answers that I wanted to call out. We did have a few people say that they're a, a, a program team of one. And so one person was like, yeah, that's me, I'm, I'm here. So hopefully uh, you're here to, you'll hear, get some help. Um, KCS can scale very largely and it, uh, the principles can be useful even for a team of one. Uh, the too many to count person, I can relate to that and not sure uh, if you're listening, I hope by the end of this, maybe you have a sense of at least the type of people in your organization who would be uh, potentially knowledge workers. Okay, let's dive into the information we have to share with you today. So, as uh, we saw on the previous page, KCS adoption requires a significant transformation. That's why we have wonderful folks who offer aligned services to help companies make that journey. Uh, but starting small, uh, having those early success stories to build momentum is a huge part of long-term KCS success. And that's why uh, over time we've developed this recommendation to adopt in waves and kind of start small. I do want to remind folks that this is part two in a multi-part series. So we have already had the plan and design event. So we're kind of skipping past that content, but this is here for you to go back and see all the content and watch the recording. Tons of great uh, discussion and question and answers happened there. And a lot of what was covered there is sort of planning and thinking about how you would 
pick and start your wave one participants. So we won't get into all of that as much today, but a lot of what we'll be saying is kind of going to reference back to that as well. And then we'll have two more series later, two more events in the series later this year, build proficiency and optimize and innovate. Those are open for registration now. So an overview of adopt in waves of this phase of the adoption and transformation guide. There are about four main things that are recommended for all waves. And again, waves are important to build our experience. And with each wave, you take what you learn and adjust and, and apply that to the next one. So first and foremost, training. Training is absolutely critical. Of course, knowledge worker training, it's an adjustment, often a big adjustment to how folks do their work. Uh, it's not additional work, but it's a it's an important change to how they do their work. So important to get them trained on the why we're doing this so that they understand what they're working towards. And listed first for a very important reason is management training. Uh, I'll make a couple other references and I'm sure our, our guest speakers today will say more about how critical it is for management to understand the vision and be aligned to the change to support that. Friends who joined us, anything to say about the training uh, set up for a good program? Well, I would, um, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to know where to start. I, I really do uh, like the fact that um, you highlight our managers first because they are going to be the, uh, you know, either key enablers, or if we're being very honest with each other, they're going to be people who get in the way of the implementation. So to the extent that managers are, you know, just focused on, oh, for goodness sakes, get to the next case, right? Where's that next ticket, right? It's going to be hard to, for people to have the time and space to learn. And, um, you know, it's not fair to expect them to, you know, wake up knowing the right messages to send about KCS and why it's important and why it's part of the job. So uh, it's it's easy to kind of bloop over the management training because they're you know they're not necessarily using the tool in the same way. Um, and then on the knowledge worker training, one of the things that the uh, adoption guide talks about that again I would I would hope not to skip over is the importance of having some component of that being hands-on, which really means instructor-led. So, you know, when when whenever we get a chance to spend time with people who will be doing KCS and, you know, help helping them take cases that they selected and brought and their case notes, and then go back and just write a knowledge base article that follows the content standard from that, um, it's just amazing how the fog lifts, right? Uh, the, the first one that we do together with, you know, coaching from all the people can be challenging. Uh, the, the second one is generally much easier. And by the third one, it's like, it feels like you've been doing it your entire life. So um, leaving time in uh, the end user training, the knowledge worker training to, uh, to actually do some hands-on work together um, really, really pays off. Yeah, we have, you know, I would add to that, David, um, the knowledge worker training uh, particularly also should be really focused on that behavior change and process and a different way of working, right? Um, that it should really be, there should be some care around making sure there's enough kind of tool training within that training, but it really is helping knowledge workers learn how to work differently. And it's not just about what button to push or where does this go? A lot of it is, you know, helping them to think differently and apply that thinking to how they work and, 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 and integrate knowledge into how they solve problems and, and work with their, with their customers. I'm so I'm so glad you said that. And you know, to me, one indicator of an issue is if you've got an implementer or a partner of any kind or somebody in training who says, uh, "Great, well, you know, on Tuesday we're going to have here's how you work a case or an incident or a ticket in our environment, and then on Wednesday we're going to talk about KCS, right? Then then like fire them, 
right? Just m move on and go somewhere else because, um, you know, a big part of the change is thinking of this all as one thing together that you do together. Yeah. I would like to add what David and both uh, Jennifer said already, the importance of this management training, that the leadership in the company is aware of what is coming and what their role and what their responsibilities will be. So before we joined this meeting, uh, we just had our own user group meeting in Germany here. And we had a customer today um, telling about their KCS journey. And I think they've, I stopped counting. It was about 10 times they said, it was so important that our superiors or a manager said, it's okay if it takes longer. It's okay to take your time to learn how to write articles, how to do this and how to do this and get proficient in all the practices and all the processes. That's just fine, just do it. We are patient, that's okay. So therefore, yes, I think we cannot stress this enough. Management training is so crucial. So the leaders, the managers in organization have to understand what is required to enable their workforce to be able to learn KCS and to adopt it. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing uh, that insight. Yes, as as we as we've seen time and time again, how how critical it is for management training. Now, the knowledge worker training is going to kind of happen anyway because they're changing their their workflows. But yes, adding that on, KCS coaching programs is another very important thing of getting started. We're going to spend a little more time later revisiting coaching, so we won't talk too much about it now. But it is a critical part of every single wave. Our members have shown for thirty years that. Basically, there's a direct correlation to the amount of time that you spend with folks KCS coaching and the benefits they get out of KCS. And it's also quite important to be thoughtful about who you pick as your coaches. And there's great guidance in the adoption guide for how to pick the right coach coaches uh, for your KCS program. Insider tip, it can't just be like, the popular person, right? That's not necessarily <laughs> the best person to pick or the person who knows everything. Uh, technology updates. This is a really, this is a topic that gets a little bit chicken or the egg for folks because I uh, often folks are very tempted to want to make their technology perfect before they start wave one. So a big part of kicking off wave one is expectation setting and you're picking your wave one folks very carefully sort of knowing that it's going to maybe be a little bit trickier for them than their future colleagues that they're they're the ones that are passionate enough to go first because it's really worth doing the KCS for a little bit in your environment before you go invest time and money in, on technology updates. Now, uh, friends who joined us, anything to say about that? Have you seen times where it is maybe worth doing some tech updates before, or would you would you stick with the guidance here of waiting till after wave one? I, I think we've seen... I, we've seen it all, <laughs> right? I mean, so, you know, I and, and, and what I mean by that is I think sometimes it's just really an evaluation of what your current state is, um, understanding what a more desired state with your technology might be, and that, um, you know, technology shouldn't limit you, right? I mean, if you have enough to get started with, then that's probably the right way to get started is with what you have. Um, if you're missing some technology components that might help you adopt KCS better, you might really consider what effort and, and or budget, right? What are the things that might help us get there so we could start off on the right foot with a little bit more, you know, um, stickiness with the technology to help us adopt better. Um, and I think other times we have what we need. We just need to put this here and put that there and we're off and running, you know? So it, there, it's really all over the place. Um, there's no one way that is the right way. I think it's really um, taking a time to um, really investigate, you know, what your current state is, what tools you have, how well are they integrated or not integrated and really kind of thinking about, do we have enough to start to play with KCS to adopt KCS to help us determine what our better tools might be um, is also something we recommend quite a lot actually is, you know, um, some of the best ways to invest are to try to do KCS with what you have to build requirements for a future 
you know, technology environment. Um, yeah, there's no one answer for that one. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. I think again, here we've we've seen everything from the one extreme. The company had nothing with regards to tools, infrastructure, and so on. So companies are asking that we would like to do to improve our service quality and say, oh, show me your technology, show me your infrastructure. We have no. Um, that was quite interesting. To the other extreme where people um, already had um, technology that it even with uh, KCS verified. So, but again, Whatever you have, whatever you start with, um, I would say it needs this update tech phase within the adoption so that you start with what you have. And then after a while, after you've got um, familiar with processes and start working, doing KCS, that you then say, okay, now I understand, or we had, we had, had we should have thought more about this one or that one, and then have the opportunity to, to update whatever you have or customize or whatever has to be done. So yeah, absolutely. This is important. And I'd like to take on uh, the excellent question that Jessica Sanderson uh, brings up in the chat, uh, which is what what is enough? So, um, you know, fortunately, we have this idea floating around the, the universe now about MVP, minimum viable product. So what's the minimum viable product for KCS? And uh, because, uh, you know, you if we try and go for perfection at wave one, right? We're going to take a very long time to launch wave one. So minimum viable product to me really goes back to the solve loop, right? So solve loop support. Um, we can wait a little while. We don't want to, but we can wait a little while on the evolve loop stuff, like some of the analytics or some of the, the, the work that supports knowledge domain analysis. But, um, you know, capture... We need to have a place where while we are working the issue that we can <clears throat> take our notes in a structured way that either are or become our knowledge base article. Typically today, those are fields in the case that then get pushed out to the knowledge base, but um, the practices guide isn't prescriptive about that, right? What you gotta have a place, it's gotta be structured. Right. So you need to have a way to say, <clears throat> this is part of the symptomology and this is where it happens and this is why and this is what you do about it. Um, or this is what somebody's trying to accomplish and here's how they go about it. And a number of series of steps. Right. So you need to have um, that structure. Probably the tallest pull in the tent is, depending on your technology, is reuse. You need to be able to say, <clears throat> you know what, <clears throat> as somebody who's doing the solve loop, I just resolved an issue using this article. And typically in a support context or an HR context or an ITSM context, but that is done by attaching an article to a case. Um, sometimes that doesn't make sense. However you do it, <clears throat> you need to be able to say, Yes, this article resolved my issue because that drives all of the reporting. Uh, and then improve. You need to have a mechanism for letting people update articles when that's appropriate, assuming they're properly licensed. Um, although it's a little bit of a corner case, I hope you need to let people be able to flag articles <clears throat> and say, although I'm not licensed to update this article, Here's what needs to happen in very specific terms, right? If you have all of that, uh, then I think you are ready to launch. Now, what you have to watch out for is all those things that the IT team will ask, add that you didn't ask for. <laughs> like, uh, well, how many people do we need to review this and what teams, right? How are we going to lock down this or how are we going to lock down that and make sure... Right. And and you can work on that stuff till you go blind. It's not really supporting the process, right? In knowledge management, the challenge is not getting, you know, the challenge is getting people to do what they ought to do. It's not keeping them from doing what they shouldn't do. Right. So let's maybe pay less attention to locking stuff down and more to enabling the core features of the solve loop to get started. Love that. Great advice. Thanks for addressing that question in the chat. And then 
and uh, the whole point of adopting waves is that after wave one, after you've learned a lot, you uh, probably have more waves. Now our friends who are in the the very small programs, the the team of one, maybe not, but you know you can you can dream, you can imagine ways to apply KCS principles even more cross functionally um, after you get started. But an important call out here is that we it's easy to keep in mind that we want the technology to improve, but other important things that we did during the planning and design phase, those foundational decisions, your content standard, your the workflow itself, even your measurement model, how you're doing rewards and recognition, all of those should be revisited uh, for each additional wave, whether you're launching to another group of folks, even in the same domain, or certainly if you're switching to a different domain, you need to take their, their environment into account. Any thoughts on important revisions for additional waves and or uh, interesting stories to tell about like some noteworthy changes after wave one before wave two? Yeah, I think uh, the content standard is a really excellent example of iterative improvement and evolution based on how the next group of people in each, you know, the next wave and the next wave all read the content standard, absorb it, learn from it, put it into practice, reference it. Um, because often, you know, as you have more users who are doing this and, and um, you know, utilizing the content standard, adhering to the content standard, the more users you have doing it now with each next wave, the more feedback you have. <laughs> so um, it's really helpful to really gather that feedback. Um, what's working needs to be noted, of course, and what's not working, right? I think this isn't just about what do we need to fix for the next wave or what, what do we need to improve and do better for the next wave? That's critically important. But it's also about recognizing what is working well oh, wow, that worked for wave two as well as it worked for wave one. Well, we really have something going with that. And, uh, you know, kind of, you know, celebrating that to a certain degree and really making sure that um, the results, right, for every wave, you wouldn't expect them to be exactly the same as the wave before. And so when it comes to those elements that are described here, the content standard, the workflow, the measurements, it's always helpful to kind of reevaluate, see where we are um, in, in preparing for the next the next wave to come. Really useful. Sometimes sometimes we've heard that um, KCS would be called agile knowledge management. So thinking in waves, thinking in sprints and thinking in reviews, I think is generally um, a good idea. And to see um, what went well, what went wrong, um, where did we have expectations that have not been met. So yes, absolutely. Uh, you have to look back and to, to see, um, is there anything that could be changed um, for the better? So. Love that. Thanks for sharing that experience. And here we have a sample timeline for Adopt in Waves. This is based on a visual that's already in the adoption guide uh, where you've uh, already done your plan and design phase. And here we're looking at, again, this visual of what adopting waves might look like. Several months with wave one, dedicated time for a tech update, subsequent waves, hopefully, especially if you're one of those folks with those many zeros at the end of the number of knowledge workers in your organization, the size of your wave uh, is hopefully getting bigger each time. So you're making more progress. And a reminder of the these sort of foundational elements of your program that need to be you know taken care of and revisited and revised constantly iterated around each time and it's also important to note i i think we'll have a call out for this later as well that you want to iterate based off of certainly the life cycle of your kcs program but also what are the changes happening in your organization that are relevant to to revisit our goals changing is leadership changing what's the what's the talking point of the month and really connecting your KCS communication plan to your organizational community. Like what's, what, how are people talking at your organization as a whole for what is important? You really want that messaging to be interwoven with each other. So, uh, and these months here really are just examples. So I'm curious to hear from our expert friends here. What, what are, what's, 
amount of what's a good amount of time for I bet I already know you're going to say it depends. What's a good amount of time for <laughs> wave wave one? I think, yeah, I think this. Sorry. Go, no, ahead. go ahead, Kai. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, Typically here in, in, in Germany, I think in Europe as well, um, we have smaller companies compared to the US. So we have less waves, I would say, and maybe it's a little bit faster to run through a wave since the group of people is smaller. But um, given all the things you have to prepare in order to do the training, get the technology up to date and so on, I think this three months seems realistic to me. Lovely for a smaller company. Great. Jennifer, what were you going to add? Well, I think I'm, you know, oh, oh yeah, I am off mute. I, I, what I was going <laughs> to add, sorry, was, you know, behavior change is happening through this wave in three months is, you know, a good amount of time to, you know, kind of plan for people needing to learn and practice. That doesn't mean that that's how much time you actually will need but it's a good baseline and um, and what we suggest. I think what you see in this example or sample is exactly that though. This is a sample of an organization that is planning for three waves, the first being small and second one being more people, third being even more people or the rest of the organization, but dependent on your size and comfort in adopting, you might not have three waves. You might have five waves. You might have seven waves. So um, I think that's really important to understand about this sample or example of how to look at planning and, and what to expect from time um, um, is that you're, you're, we're not saying that you need to get everybody into three waves. We're saying you need to plan in a wave approach. And for some, that might be more than three waves. Some for smaller organizations might be two, might be one. Um, so this this is to also be evaluated. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Yeah, the, I mean, the wave size thing. So so doing it by the book, which which we recommend uh, yeah. is, is, you know, says that wave one would be something generally between 20 and 40 people now, depending on your business sometimes you can uh, parallelize that and do a few more but you know the logic there i think is that fewer than 20 people it's hard to demonstrate that you've moved the needle um which is uh to, to reggie's point is something you want to be able to do right every wave should be a reference for uh subsequent waves and you know more than 40 people in that first wave your change management burden uh, starting with coaching is really high. So 20 to 40, uh, you can expand with each wave. One of the things to keep in mind here, and I like to say it's a good problem to have, but that doesn't mean it's not a problem, is executives who are like, this is great. You have my full support. I want to do it. Let's go, go, go KCS. And then you say, well, we have, you know, a jillion skillion people and therefore it's going to take us six waves, you know, which is nominally a year and a half. And, and, and they're like, no, that's completely unacceptable. You need to roll it out by, I, I don't know. Uh, let's see, what is it? June now? <laughs> everybody, everybody needs to be doing this by September uh, um, and appreciate the enthusiasm and appreciate uh, the, the support and the change management burden for doing this right, particularly with coaching, means that, that you just can't hit hundreds of people uh, in a very brief period of time, right? We need to, we need to build this up. So um, uh, difficult conversations to have with your leadership sometimes include, you know, go slow to go fast. And I was in a at an industry conference quite a few years ago um, when I had been unsuccessful in encouraging an executive to take their time in rolling this out um, to the entire organization. And, and they were like, well, David, I, I can't wait that long to get the value. And, um, you know, he was relaunching his program two and a half years later. He said in this conference, well, that guy over there told me I shouldn't do it to my entire thousand person organization 
at once. And that's why we're, and I didn't listen and that's why we're relaunching. So uh, I know those conversations can be hard. We want to harness that enthusiasm. That's wonderful. Uh, but, but you got to stay over your skis, right? You, you, you can't get uh, so far ahead. So take the time to do it right. Uh, celebrate the wins and victories along the way, as as Reggie suggests. Uh, use the experience that you've had to show how it's going to help other people. Uh, but but take your time so you don't skip over coaching, so you don't skip over other change management, so you give the most people the best technology they can have. Thank yeah. You. So cutting corners is a bad idea. Mm. Well said. I have uh, pulled out a quote here from the adoption guide that summarizes a lot of what we've been saying, which is that the most frequent challenge in realizing and sustaining KCS benefits is management's failure to embrace new value-based measures. So taking the time to find the wins, celebrate the wins, showcase them, and make sure management is trained, like we talked about plenty already, and making sure that they understand why and how we're going to be recognizing the value that the KCS program is is creating is really important. And that is an important thing for getting resources and buy-in for things like coaching, which are, are critically important and sometimes can be trickier for management to understand dedicating those resources. We joke, we joke about ROI that sometimes they want the R without the I, and we have to sort of ask we need to ask for our eye <laughs> and and have have shared understanding about what why we're going to have return on that good investment. The last part of this section of the adoption guide talks about indicators of adoption. So kind of how do we know that we're on the right track <laughs> with this phase of the adoption and transformation guide? So Really important, uh, I think all of you folks have highlighted this in different ways that when knowledge workers see the value, experience the benefit of KCS, that's when things really become a habit and that's why we do things uh, in waves and learn from each wave, as you've said. And this is when we can start to see that our baseline measures that we looked at before we launched have started to improve. So decreased cost per incident because we are resolving certainly uh, known issues faster and uh, better service quality because folks are getting better answers because they're more accurate. They're based off of collective experience and your knowledge workers generally enjoy their job a little bit more. There's less redundant work, uh, more team camaraderie, more visibility to how they're contributing to the bigger picture. And Another important thing to keep in mind as you're moving through these waves, I mentioned this a bit at the beginning when we looked at the timeline, is ongoing stakeholder engagement. So this is where you really want to make sure that you're continuing to connect your KCS communication plan and the way you're talking about it. It's really integrated with how your business is businessing. So those cycles of leadership changes or is it quarterly goals or annual resets of focuses that's where you wanna make sure you're revisiting that strategic framework. That's a living, breathing document. That's not something you uh, do once and forget about it. Uh, how are you finding new and important ways uh, to showcase visibility to impact both directly to the knowledge workers themselves and mm -hmm. reminding senior leadership, sometimes frequently to, to repeat those wins because uh, sometimes it can mean more coming from them and just ongoing change management practices as you move through. Friends, anything that stands out that you want to comment on about indicators of adoption, how, how you really know that you're doing it right? Sure. Uh, you know, when while, while I'm adopting in waves, right, or while an organization is adopting in waves, you really want to look at two big things. One, are people doing it? And two, are they doing it with quality? Right. So in terms of in terms of it, you know, they're doing it right. Um, so things that, you know, favorite KCS measures like uh, create rate, how often people are updating articles, um, 
blink rate, right? Just the like, are are people doing the things? Uh, is and and are they increasingly do it? And who are the outliers, right? So, of course, we never want to put goals on activities. However, um, just tracking and making sure that we're kind of heading in the right direction is really useful. And the other is, are we doing things with quality? So uh, here's where your process adherence review or PAR can help. We typically reserve that for those who've been licensed, but um, you certainly are looking at, are people following the solve loop while they're getting licensed? Similarly, the content standard checklist, are people creating content uh, that is is the content standard and um, you know we we one way of looking at that is if you have a healthy licensing program and i hope you do um and then just making sure that people are developing the competencies that you've laid out to get licensed which is far more than i know how to write an article that follows the content standard far more than i uh you know follow the solve loop it's like am i am i really creating content when I need to while I'm doing the work or am I coming back later and doing it, right? If coming back later, um, that's not a good indicator of adoption, right? So uh, whatever it is that your competencies list is for getting people licensed, uh, Appendix D of the Practices Guide is a good place to start and you might narrow that down. Um, th that's what you're, that's what you're looking for here. Are people doing it? Are they increasingly doing it? Are they doing it with good quality? And are they meeting their requirements to get licensed within those two or three months um, that we're running this wave? And I think, sorry, please. And I think on 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 top of that, um, yes, indicators are important, and um, like David said, the power and linking rate and all this kind of stuff, all the KPIs we have. But I think on top of that, it's important to talk to your people, to your knowledge workers and listen. And um, we speak in the, the practices workshop about effective communication. So do they really got the idea? Do they really understood what it is all about? Can they explain in their own words what it's about? Or do they just repeat the phrases that we indoctrinated to them? So is there really understanding? I think this is an important indicator as well. Does everybody understand what's in it for them, what's in it for us all, and um, why they should do it? Great advice. And a quote from the Indicators of Adoption section, don't stop here, knowledge worker motivation to continue using the knowledge base will be lost unless the redundant work gets removed from the workflow. So there's uh, advice in there about how to make sure you're doing root cause analysis and issue elimination. So, cause visibility to impact isn't just about proving to the knowledge workers that they're knowledge working properly. It's showing that the the insights we're getting from a mature KCS, a maturing KCS program are actually turning into organizational improvement in products and services and helping them see the connection between their work and uh, baseline improvements like that, really important to help them stay motivated. So I mentioned uh, our amazing consortium members at the beginning of our call. So in case you don't know, uh, consortium members, membership dues are the biggest source of funding for this work to continue. And it's not just the funding, it's that they come and tell us how to make it better because consortium members are folks who are living and breathing KCS in the real world, constantly learning, and generously coming back to uh, the membership at large and uh, poking at it. That's why we're on version six of KCS. And even though that's a version number that's been in place for several years, countless updates to the methodology, even since that version was released, uh, additional appendices, and then tons of examples to share that they uh, keep just coming back and telling us uh, what what they've learned just in just in the spirit of KCS. So a couple that I wanted to call out here, of course, there's tons and tons if you search along our website and digital library, but um, Alation had a great webinar that they presented. Uh, this links to a recording from 2022, where they really talked through their 
approach for setting up for success and how they sort of got going with wave one. And then I can tell you the fast forward version of the story is that Alation presented this past spring at our annual in-person summit. And turns out they did all the right things because their program is a great, great success. They're having really good uh, employee engagement with it. The folks are really bought in and, and excited to continue improving the program and participate. Uh, leadership is bought in. And a couple takeaways from Alation's most recent in-person presentation was that uh, during the uh, sort of initial phases of adoption, at times when they felt like they were over communicating, now when they look back, they realize that means they were doing just the right amount of communication. Uh, and then they really highlighted how important it's been to have their senior leadership involved and bought in. And, and they told some great stories about how and, and how often their senior leadership is giving visibility company-wide to the success of the, of the KCS program. So great story there. Change management, we've talked about a bunch. It's just kind of inherent in a, in a transformation like this. So we have a link here to a, a great recording um, from a former member who really uh, gave great advice for how to incorporate change, man change management practices into a KCS adoption. And then a couple other important things to call out here, and then I'm gonna ask our friends to, to comment is uh, we've talked about coaching, very, very important. Uh, the saying goes now in our community that we've never seen a successful long-term KCS program sustained without a coaching program sustained right along with it. So this is a great list of resources and advice for how to sort of get leadership buy-in into a coaching program. And then uh, once again, for our friends with the very, very large uh, organizations who have many, maybe many more than three waves to do, uh, there's an approach called a KCS Center of Excellence. And there's great advice here for how to take a, a, a COE approach for scaling your KCS program across many, many, many knowledge workers. Uh, friends, comments. I think we have not talked enough about coaching. So... Uh, should we give should we give some some oxygen to the topic of coaching? What do you want to what do you want to say about it? Okay, I'm breathing <laughs> oxygen. Um, just referring back to the customer we were talking um, earlier about that um, showing their KCS journey. They once again said, without having coaches, we wouldn't have the success we've seen so far. Again and again and again, the story is always the same. Without coaching, you don't have sustainable success with KCS. Yes, and um, the explanation is is on this page as well. It's it's a change. It's a big change for the knowledge workers to work in a different way than they did before. And it's not just the initial training. It's not just now tell me how to do this or how to do that, but constantly again and again and again, have coaches on their side and help them understand and get better and improve. So yes, without coaching, no success, period. Jennifer, David? No, I was, I, you know, 100% to what Kai said, absolutely. Uh, coaching, I think we often have a kind of unhelpful view in our head of what it means. I think we often get coaching and mentoring confused, right? And I know we have some some real like professional trained coaches uh, uh, here joining us. So um, I'm, I am I want to be sensitive to that, but, but really coaching is not somebody who's there to tell you what to do. Coaching is not somebody there who's judging you. Uh, coach is not, coaching is not somebody who's in authority over you, you're, you're helping, you're helping people achieve the goals that they want to achieve. And hopefully they want to achieve uh, mastery or at least proficiency of KCS, because that's an important part of the job. So um, make sure that your coaches um, understand that it's their job to help, that they're not there to judge. I talked with uh, somebody in an organization once one of you will recognize this moment uh, where they said, well, you know, uh, unfortunately, I've got the mean coach. Uh, I've got right. the mean coach, right? And um, the, 
in in other words, you know, somebody who like beats me up about uh, you know a spelling mistake or some little thing that's not quite right that doesn't really matter in terms of the helpfulness of the audience. Coaches need to understand that ninety nine percent of the time, if somebody creates a knowledge based article that documents what happened then the world is a better place. The world is a better place for having that knowledge base article in it. And if, as one of my clients wrote, they say miswired, M-I-S-S space W-I-R-E-D, right? It's probably she had a sash. And if, if somebody says miswired rather than miswired, it's okay. I, when I see it, every use is a review, I'll, I'll update it. Um, but we want to be focused on uh, the big picture, uh, Liz Bunger, who's on this call, um, once sort of told told us in a group, you know what, having coaches who are fixated on you spelled this wrong or this grammar is a little bad are, are really kind of unhelpful in the big picture. So uh, like Fred Rogers said, always look for the helpers. The coaches should be helpers. Love that. Can any of you comment on um, from the chat someone posted about not having, wanting to financially reward our coaches? So how do we get coaches involved without financial incentives? Yeah, I, I was looking at that one in the <laughs> chat and was also kind of hoping just to kind of respond verbally versus right in the chat. But Perfect. Um, I think that can um, really be, you know, demotivating perhaps for some, but even, you know, and, um, more so about, I mean, coaches have to want to be a coach. They have to want to be there in a position, building relationships to actually help their teammates, their peers become successful in KCS. And if they don't want that, if they're not opting into the role of a coach and we're having to coerce them <laughs> into the role no. <laughs> we're probably already losing <clears throat> um um so it I, I think it's really identifying in the organization pretty well like who are the right people who want to be in the role and are they in the role because um I, I really have not seen you know really good experiences in in you know financially or you know with rewards trying to you know um incentivize coaches to perform in that position or be in that position. Um, I think I agree with some of the comments in the chat as well about this, though. I mean, the coaching role itself is an opportunity to learn new skills. It is a chance to maybe develop opportunities to cr grow your career into other areas and into management. Um, but if they truly are not yet interested in helping others and actually want to help the team be successful with KCS, I think we're trying to use the wrong things to motivate them. Yeah. And then money would help. <laughs> well, so somebody who doesn't want to be a doesn't want to be a coach uh, will not get motivated by earning hundred bucks more. Mm -hmm. Well said. Wonderful. Um, and apparently I picked all quotes of related to management here. <laughs> uh, KCS is a bigger change for management than it is for knowledge workers. And um, the reason I put this here again, because I knew we would look at it after talking about coaching and that as much as we have learned and heard the incredible value and return of coaching and that you can't have KCS without coaching, it is probably the thing that we hear most often is the hardest to get management bought into the resources. Uh, the time to set aside for coaching is seen as um, something that is too expensive. And we just have so much evidence that the return is so much greater than, than the time spent. Uh, we have stories from other members where um a member company F5, we have a recording of, of their story where at one point uh, during a, a tough time management even said, well, we, we actually need to pause coaching. We don't, we don't have time because we're so busy due to some things going on. And turns out people secretly kept coaching 
and being coached because they loved it so much. And they have a, a really fun story to tell and, and they've tracked some amazing benefits um, that go well beyond just KCS measures that correlate, again, that time spent coaching to just being better better employees, being better contributors to the organization. And so um, doing the storytelling and then the, the proof to management over time, how important that is. Um, yeah, yeah, Sarah. I mean, just just imagine managers like saying the quite part out loud. Like managers coming in and saying, "You you better not take time to help each other. Right? You're <laughs> you're going to be in real big trouble if you help you if you help your colleagues do their job better, right? It's it's yeah. it's nuts. So one of the things um, I, I I think we've learned over the years, Jennifer and I, is that when managers hear about the coaching time investment they think it's in perpetuity, right? And if you follow the practices guide and and we find this works in the real world, um, it's a very limited time thing, right? The, the US military has this uh, program called Up or Out. And once you reach a certain level of seniority, um, you're expected to get promoted in a certain amount of time. And if you don't, um, then you are thanked for your service. And you uh, can go get a civilian job. And, the, you know, we we kind of want the same thing. We don't want people who are using the practice as God's word, candidates, right? People who are not fully licensed. They're sort of doing it, but they're not fully licensed. We don't want them hanging around and taking time with coaches, you know, on a sort of endless basis. If people haven't gotten licensed in a couple of months, maybe three right then then there's there's some reason either either that they're not capable but much more often they just don't want to and if like that's somebody who doesn't want to uh get good at kcs well then that's that's a management discussion right that's an issue but i as a coach can't fix that so i, I don't want to throw my good time after bad so the investment in coaching is time bounded during this this time period where we want to get people up to speed we want to get them fully licensed uh and and if for whatever reason they they don't choose to do that or they can't um then then i'm not going to continue to spend time with them right so the 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 coaching investment is not small but it's very time bounded yeah. okay well i have time to add to add a little bit more to the big change for managers in there absolutely I'll keep it short, I promise. <laughs> um, I think a lot of managers also just kind of think, oh, KCS, the knowledge workers are going to be changing how they work. We're going to be coaching. You know, they're going to be learning how to do this in the tool. It's all about the knowledge workers. And so therefore, the program managers managing all the change in the planning, the trainers are executing on training, the coaches are doing coaching. But then, and so they're kind of like, oh, my team's doing KCS, we're adopting KCS. But what about what their role is in helping the wave that their teams are participating in or waves um, be successful, right? They also need to be work change how they work. They need to be talking more about KCS. They need to talk more about how is this working within the team? What did you find really interesting in the work this week? What new article that was written this week did you find really helpful? they also have an important part in changing how they work so they can facilitate everyone else going through these changes through adoption. Um, and I think that's really overlooked a lot of the time. And so I, I think, you know, that quote there um, uh, is also quite relevant to just really managers recognizing for themselves and us helping them recognize this, um, their their role in the success of of the waves and the adoption of KCS. Love that. Give that give them something to brag about, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's a that's a way to make their job easier. Yes, yes <laughs> absolutely. So in our final just couple minutes here, I'm highlighting um and and one of those re newer resources I mentioned. The members are constantly working on new resources. So uh, a newer appendix about the why behind you know there's there's reasons why. Uh, the the guidance exists in the in the methodology we have published. So members came together and, and distilled why we do each of these things uh, in this phase in our adoption and transformation journey. And so, just a quick reference of of 
understanding the why of we're approaching things in this way. Um, and it's been proven time and time again to be successful. In our last two minutes, any final thoughts? Thank you so much, Kai and Jennifer and David. I'm gonna say that right now before, before we end the meeting. Any final thoughts? Everything said. <laughs> we covered it all. <laughs> I sort of feel like if there's if there's um additional questions, you know, following you know what we talked about here, anything, you know, we're open to you know reaching out to us directly or through LinkedIn. So you know, if we want to keep the conversation going, we have a chance to do that. Amazing. We'll put uh, links to your LinkedIn uh in the follow up email that we send to everyone with the recording and the resources. How about that? Great. Thanks. Anything else? Did we cover all the highlights from the chat? We did. Hope so. Thanks to everyone who also contributed in the chat. I didn't have a chance to look at it completely yet, but can't wait to dig in. I know lots of <laughs> great wisdom was shared there as well. What a wonderful way to spend an hour. Thank you again so much to our experienced trainers and service providers and to everyone who attended and participated and can't wait to see you at another event soon.